Okay. Uh, let's um, let's get started then. Uh, what I want to do today is talk about uh, community ecology. Uh, that's not the ecology of your little human community. Um, I'm talking about ecological communities, so it's a, it's a much bigger concept. Um, and what we've done up to this point is we've talked about population growth and population dynamics. I know we've skipped a few things. Uh, we didn't do our um, cemetery um, lab uh, where we go and hang out with the dead people. But, um, and we didn't do any projections for uh, population growth based on uh, data that we got from the literature or anything. Uh, but I think you probably have a pretty good sense of, of uh, how population growth works. If you've been paying attention to the um, to the COVID data that's coming, not just out of CMO, but um, from across the U.S., in, even worldwide, uh, it's pretty scary. Um, there are now, uh, as of last Thursday, there were 504 um, COVID cases on the CMO campus. That includes employees and students. Um, students are the lion's share of that. Um, and that makes sense because students are more social and, and um, have more interpersonal contact than do employees. Um, but when you look at those data, you realize pretty quickly that it's exponential growth. And if you look at the data for the entire United States, it's exponential growth. And as a matter of fact, right now we're in a position where uh, the rate of growth is explosive. I mean, it is on the steepest part of the exponential curve. Uh, we had one episode of exponential growth in the spring, uh, and that seemed to tamp down a little bit. And then we had another period uh, in the summer where it shot up again. And that was a little bit worse than the spring episode, so that was presumably our second wave. And, and now, unlike Europe, which is just entering their second wave, we're entering our third wave. Um, and this wave dwarfs everything by comparison. So up to this point, um, what is it? Uh, how many people have died? It's, we're coming up on 250,000 um, people have died. Uh, and the projection is that by December, we will be close to uh, 400,000 deaths. So that's pretty scary. Um, by, the, by January 20th, it's, it's entirely feasible that we'll have half a million people um, die in the United States from COVID. Uh, the number of cases is something like 11 million. So if you think, well, only 250,000 deaths out of 11 million, that's a pretty small percentage. And, and that's true, right? It's not, it's not huge. Um, but it is significant just the same, uh, especially if it's somebody in your family that succumbs. And it's not fair to say that it's just uh, old people that are dying of the disease. I mean, certainly old people make up the, the greatest portion. Um, but as people with underlying health conditions, what are those underlying health conditions? They can be anything from obesity um, to diabetes to uh, kidney disease or asthma or COPD or anything of that sort. So there's lots of things that are contributing to that. Um, and of course, you understand, right, that the exponential model of population growth uh, can't go on indefinitely at some point. Um, it's going to reach a carrying capacity. And that's certainly true for the virus. The virus will reach a carrying capacity, at which point it can't grow any farther. And of course, that happens when it runs out of hosts. We are the hosts, right? We are the resource that the virus is exploiting. Uh, so when it's exhausted us, then the virus is going to go away. Of course, that means that our population has been seriously um, decimated. Um, so that's obviously something we'd like to avoid. But I think you have a good sense of the dynamics of that. Um, and just saying that it's going to magically disappear uh, one day and everything is going to be fine, uh, I think is foolish. Um, I don't know if you guys uh, have been paying attention to the news, um, but uh, the uh, Coronavirus Task Force has been making all sorts of recommendations about social distancing and mask use and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and the current um, presidential administration is ignoring most of that and flaunting it. Uh, and in fact, Donald Trump has a medical advisor, his, his personal advisor for COVID, uh, 
who has come out strongly against the use of masks and uh, shutting down the economy and social distancing. Um, and he criticized uh, the Michigan governor for imposing mask mandates and, and closing down some businesses um, and said that the citizens of, of uh, Minnesota should rise up against her. And of course, as you'll recall, she's the governor who um, there was an assassination plot and a terrorist, white supremacist terrorist plot that was going after her that the FBI fortunately was able to thwart. Um, but those are the sorts of dynamics that we're living through right now in, in this current political climate that's sort of um, disconcerting. At any rate, uh, I think you understand how that works. Uh, we've spent some time talking about interspecific competition, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, and we've talked about predation, and we've talked about stable limit cycles, and um, functional responses, and how the shape of the functional response determines uh, what those predator-prey um, interactions look like, whether it's a stable limit cycle, or cycles to extinction, or has this sort of odd kind of cyclical behavior where it always goes back to stability. Um, but we've done all of that, and now what we want to do is, is put all of that together uh, in some sort of uh, cohesive framework. Um, so what we're talking about are communities, and those communities represent this complex set, set of interactions uh, between the species that make up the community. So it's a community is this collection of species, um, and I know that's a sort of a vague um, concept, uh, just as if you look at it on a human scale, uh, when you talk about your community, right, well, our community of Cape Girardeau, um, and then embedded within that community of Cape Girardeau is the Latino community and the black community and the white community um, and the gay community and, and this community and that. And we sub, you know, the golf, the golfer community and the, uh, you know, the, it, it's just this sort of, it's this vague concept, right? So what, what is it that we mean when we're talking about um, a community? Well, we're talking about the species that occur there, um, but we're also talking about the physical environment. So, you know, um, where are these species? Uh, what are they contending with? That sort of stuff. Um, and if you, and I know that's not a very satisfying definition yet, we will get to a point where we come up with a better definition. Uh, but until the 1970s, uh, and actually early into the 1970s, um, all of the work that was done on community ecology was purely descriptive. Uh, people would just sort of describe the species and and the abundance and the average temperature and the amount of precipitation and all of that sort of stuff. It wasn't a particularly, um, uh, well, it was essential, but it wasn't the sort of information that you really need to understand how these communities function. And, there, and there's another issue, what do we mean by function or what do we mean by structure? Early on, it was very difficult to try and figure out what we even meant by all of this, okay? So since then, there has been a lot of theoretical development, and that's important because once you have the theory, right, you can test hypotheses and you can figure out what works, what doesn't work, what's meaningful, what isn't meaningful. So since the 1970s, there has been a lot of work on community ecology and the theory of community ecology, but it's a very slow process. The reason it's so slow is because the system is so complex. It's not simple. All right, so what do we mean by communities? Communities are associations of interacting populations, okay? So they are groups, populations that occur together. Um, and sometimes we'll look at communities and, and we'll give them some sort of name or, or we'll try to describe the community in some kind of um, meaningful way. So we might refer to the um, Oak Hickory community. Well, as you know, we live in the, in the um, hard, to, 
hardwood deciduous forests of the Midwest. And those hardwood deciduous forests are dominated by oaks and hickories. Okay? Um, why are they called hardwood deciduous forests? What is a hardwood? Is anybody here a woodworker? Do any woodworking? What's a hardwood compared to a softwood? Is pine a softwood? Pine is a softwood. Does it have to do with bark? Nope. It has to do with the kind of leaves. So if the tree is deciduous, it's a hardwood. If uh, the tree is evergreen, it's a softwood. Okay? Well, you know that's kind of silly if you do woodwork, right? Because you can pick up some oak or some hickory and try and cut it, and it's a hell of a lot more work than trying to cut maple or aspen or something of that sort. Right, aspen is just like paper, it's, you know, it's not very hard at all. Right, so uh, the terminology that we use is kind of archaic, but what we mean when we say hardwood deciduous forest is we mean, right, the oaks and the hickories if you go out to Kelso, you realize that it's not just oaks and hickories. There are pecans out there, and there are many types of hickories. There are many types of oaks out there. Plus, there are going to be maples and sassafras trees and pawpaws and all that kind of stuff. It's not just oaks and hickories. Or we could talk about deserts, right? The desert community. But if you've ever spent any time in the desert, you realize that there are many different kinds of deserts. The, the Mojave Desert is fundamentally different from the Chihuahuan or the Sonoran Desert or the Kalahari or the Great Victoria Desert or the Negev Desert. Each desert has its own sort of unique character and its own sort of unique interactions with, with the world. Okay. Um, so, in general, though, what happens is we're talking about a dominant component of a community, and that becomes the namesake. So, when we talk about the Sonoran Desert, right, what is it that we're talking about? Okay. So, um, let's imagine we are talking about the Sonoran Desert. Where does the desert begin? Where does it end? Or let's make it simpler. Imagine you're in, in Southern California and you're going to drive up to Northern California, so you're going to get on Interstate 5, uh, sarcastically referred to as Scenic Route 5, and it's not even a little bit scenic. But you start on, on Interstate 5 and you travel north. So what's the first community that you encounter? Well, the first community that you encounter is, is all the Los Angeles and all the concrete and the asphalt and the mega malls and the mini malls and, and all of that sort of stuff and houses, 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 houses everywhere you look. And as you go north, right, you finally break out of that, right, and then what kind of habitat are you in? Well, you go over El Cajon Pass or something like that, so you're up in the mountains a little bit, and then you drop down into what is that? Is that sagebrush or is that desert? It's creosote? I mean, what is it? And as you go north, you see these subtle changes in the vegetation, but it would be impossible to say, oh, this is where the sagebrush ends and this is where the desert begins. There are no firm boundaries. Okay? Just as if you're in the hardwood deciduous forest, okay? And you start going south from Cape. You start going south. Where does the hardwood deciduous forest end and the bottomland hardwood forest begin? It's hard. As a matter of fact, we, right here in Cape Girardeau, are on the edge, on the dividing line between those two different sorts of habitats. Essentially, historically at least, up until the early 1800s, Everything south of us would have been bottomland hardwood forest. That's no longer true because we drained all the swamps. Okay? So what we are going to have to do is restrict our definitions to populations interacting strongly with some reason, within some reasonable geographic boundaries. 
So we're going to have to impose some kind of geographic boundary on the system, recognizing that that's an artificial boundary. It's not a, a true biological boundary. All right, so uh, the next thing is that communities have what we refer to as open ecological structures. Uh, so I need to talk about what I mean by open and what I mean by structure. Okay? Oh, let's, let's begin with the hard ones. What do we mean by the structure of a community? If, if someone were to talk to you, what is the structure of the Latino community in the United States? What would you say? What do you mean by structure? Well, that, what is that? I mean, somehow, internally, we know what we mean, right? But how do you describe what you mean by the structure of something? You're talking about the structure of a building or the structure of a freeway system. It's probably a little bit easier to understand. The structure of the freeway system is going to be how many lanes are there, which freeways intersect with what other freeways, where are the major off-ramps, the on-ramps. You know, does this thing climb in elevation, go down in elevation, right? What's the roadbed look like? What, what's the lowest bridge on this thing, what's the tallest bridge, all that sort of stuff would refer to the structure. How do you do that for a community? Well, we could think about how many species are in that community. And then we could think about the interactions between those species. And then we could think about the diversity of the different levels. So we could talk about the food webs and the interactions between all of the species. We could begin to talk about the complexity of the system. Okay? Uh, so are the, are, the interactions, uh, are the interactions such that it promotes stability or do the interactions... Uh, um, reduce stability of the system. Is the system resilient? In other words, once you perturb it, does it return to some kind of stability point or does it cycle out of control? So we need to think about the flow of energy in the system. We need to think about competitive interactions. We need to think about how climate and environmental conditions influence all of this. It's going to be a pretty big sort of set of questions that we end up addressing. And next, uh, what do we mean by open? Well, let's think about that for just a moment. Uh, let's think about the Mojave Desert. Um, so the Mojave Desert is dominated by creosote bush. And creosote, I mean, it's you fly over the Mojave Desert with the in an airplane and you look down and you can just see mile after mile after mile of creosote. And as you look down there are a couple of things that you notice. First, it appears that all the creosote bushes are perfectly spaced. And they are. It's almost as though somebody planted them. Okay, They are perfectly spaced. And that's occurring naturally. That's kind of weird. right? I mean something is going on the results in that perfect spacing of these creosote bushes. So then you realize, though, that there's a lot of other stuff going on. Because if you were to get on the ground and look at these creosote bushes, you would discover that there are all these seeds on the ground. But if you look, you'll notice that big seeds tend to be in one place, and little tiny seeds tend to be in a different place. And the seeds come from all these different species of plants. And then you notice that there are holes at the base of these creosote bushes. And some of those holes belong to lizards, some belong to mice, some belong to kangaroo rats, some belong to snakes. So everything is out there. That Mojave Desert is just teeming with life. And yet if you walk through it, you won't see anything. Nothing. Well, you might see the occasional lizard. You might see the occasional snake, but for the most part, you're not going to see anything. You come back in the night, 
and everything is moving. Everything in the desert, not everything, but almost everything in the desert is happening at night, not during the day. It makes sense, right? Because the daytime is a pretty nasty place in the desert. The other thing you notice about the Mojave Desert is that stuff is weird, right? I mean, you can go out into the Mojave Desert and you'll see all of these tracks going through the desert. And you go, what the hell is that? Those are the places where Sherman trained his tank corps during the Second World War in preparation for combat with the Germans in Africa. In other words, when you damage part of the desert, it stays damaged for a very long time. So that's 50, 70 years ago, and you can still see where Sherman trained his tank corps in the Mojave. Just as a side note, if you understand your, your US history or your recent history, who won the, 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 the battle for Africa in the desert in the Sahara? The Germans? or the Allies? That's something you should know. I want to say Germans? No, they lost. The Allies won. And the next question is why? I mean, Rommel had his tank corps, and Rommel was unstoppable. But he lost. And the reason he lost is because of a biologist. OK? The reason Sherman won is because of one biologist, this weird, funky guy. He was a physiologist. I think he was at UCLA. And what this guy did, he was interested in desert biology. And he got a dog, he got a donkey, and he got a man. And he worked with these three subjects in the desert. And he was studying the water biology of these people of these organisms, right? How much water do they need? How much water do they sweat? How much water do they excrete? All of that sort of stuff. He was looking at the renal biology of these three organisms, and he came back with recommendations that were then adopted by Sherman. And the recommendation was this. For each member inside of a tank, that soldier needed to have two canteens filled with water. The Germans only had one. So the reason Sherman won was because they weren't dehydrated and the Germans were. I don't know if you've ever been inside of a tank, but when that thing is moving, it's hot and it's loud and it's noisy and it's extremely uncomfortable. Okay? And you sweat a lot, especially if you're in a desert environment in the summertime. And the Americans had two canteens, the Germans didn't. And that's why the Germans lost. It's that simple. Back to the biology, right? Not the renal biology, but what do I mean by open structure? What I mean is if you're there in the Mojave, and there you are, the species that defines the Mojave Desert is the creosote bush. And there are all these rodents in there. So you're there, you're working in the Mojave, and you're trapping these rodents, and some of the rodents you're trapping are Merriam's kangaroo rats. And then, you go outside of the desert, you go up into the mountains, you're in the pinyon juniper, and sure enough, you're catching Merriam's kangaroo rats. Or you're catching a bird species that you also found in the desert. Some of the plants that you see outside of the desert are also found inside the desert. In other words, the structure of the community is open. It's not like there's a fence around it. Some of the stuff that's in that community occurs elsewhere. Let's think about how that desert evolved, where it came from. What was the habitat of central or southern California, say, 30 million years ago? Was it desert? No. The desert is a relatively new phenomenon. 30 million years ago, it would have been a forested landscape. So at some point, the climate changed, tectonic shifts, all that sort of stuff, 
the climate change, that tertiary madre geoflora disappeared and ultimately was replaced by a desert habitat. Now you think about where do all of the species in that desert come from? Just think about the lizards. Where do the species come from? Well, some of them came from the Midwest, some of them came down from the North, some of them came from the South. Okay? So all these species got into the desert coming from different places. In other words, there is no fence around that community. It's open. Animals can come in, animals can leave. Plants can come in, plants can leave. Of course, plants leave by propagules, right? They don't pull up their roots and walk off, right? But they can spread their seeds and so on, and they can spread beyond just the boundaries of the desert. And that brings up the next point, and that is our community's evolutionary unit. What I mean by that is, are these communities of organisms co-evolved? Do they have a long co-evolutionary history? And that's important. Why is it important? Because of the effects of interspecific competition. If you think about it, when species are competing for resources, natural selection is operating on those species to favor some attributes over other attributes. If the system is to persist, we expect natural selection to reduce the competition between species. So the end result of competition should be no competition. All right? So now these species are in this community if they have a long shared evolutionary history what you expect to see is very little competition amongst the species. All right? Of course if they don't have a long shared evolutionary history then you might expect to see lots of competition. Well, that brings up the next point. What are the units of selection? Now, we've talked about that a little bit, okay, um, when we were talking about natural selection and how natural selection works. At what level does selection operate? Well, uh, I think most people would agree that natural selection operates at the level of the individual. Uh, right now, there are lots and lots and lots of people that are walking around without masks on. I was just out and about over the weekend. I went to, you know, the hardware store. And uh, for the most part, everybody is wearing a mask. But then, sure enough, there will be one person without a mask, right? Just la-di-da, as though nothing was wrong and nothing is going on. And you're thinking to yourself, this person right, is tempting natural selection. Because natural selection is going to rear its ugly head and infect that person with COVID, and the alleles that are present within that organism are potentially going to be removed from the population. It's that easy. It's, a, it's evolution in action. It's a glorious thing to watch. Okay, I mean, it's sad for the family and all of that sort of stuff, but right there it is. So we understand that natural selection operates at the level of the individual, but there are those that argue that natural selection actually operates at the level of the allele, because it's alleles that are passed on from one generation to the next. Okay, so does natural selection operate at the level of the allele? Well, it may very well, but of course, an allele by itself doesn't present itself to the environment. It is oftentimes masked by other alleles. So it's a little bit harder to make that case. There are others that argue that natural selection operates at the level of the nitrogenous base pair. Okay? So there, can you go, does natural selection operate at the level of the population? In other words, do populations get selected for or selected against. As an example of sort of the complexity of this issue, 
think for a moment about, um, about homosexuality. There are those that would argue that people that are gay right, or lesbian are going to be selected against by natural selection. Because if you're gay or lesbian, your reproductive output is going to be seriously limited. And therefore, consequently, right, the alleles that code for that behavior are going to disappear from the population. If that were true, it would be hard to explain why there are so many gay and lesbian people out there. So either there are no alleles that code for gayness, or gayness is something that is much more complex. It may be something that is a consequence of a whole suite of alleles, or it may not be genetic at all, or it might be genetic but in a very indirect sort of way. And of course the next question is, does gayness really influence fitness? Are people that gay, are people that are gay or lesbian, do they have pure offspring? Well, I have a fair number of lesbian friends and all of them are moms. Okay? So just being lesbian doesn't mean you can't have children. Just being gay doesn't mean you can't have children, right? So, but that illustrates the difficulty that we have in defining the level at which natural, natural selection operates. One of the things that is incumbent upon that level of selection is reproduction. In other words, if you're a unit of selection and you're not reproducing, you're not the level of selection. Do populations reproduce? Individuals reproduce, but do populations reproduce? Well, sometimes populations split, okay? But does the population as a whole reproduce? How about communities? Do communities reproduce? Well, sometimes they split, right? But do they make copies of themselves? That's harder to explain. All right. So the, the, if, if um, we think about this, and I, and I know this is all sort of um, turgid, in terms of the explanations and so on, but it is a complex, it's a complex phenomenon and it's difficult to explain it in just a very simple sort of a way, which should make you a little bit suspicious right off the bat, okay? Um, so one of the things that you might then infer is do populations replace themselves within communities? If you, or do species replace each other inside a community? So let's imagine you have a community of organisms, a community of species. Those species interact with one another in very defined sorts of ways. If one species is removed, will that species be replaced by a different species? Is that a possibility? Let's imagine you have a species of bird, a group of bird species in a community, and for whatever reason, one species goes extinct in that community. Is it now possible for a different species to come in and exploit the resources that were used by that species? Is there a one-to-one -one replacement of species within the community? All right. Let's, um, let's look at some, um, at some uh, communities. So this is a, a Sonoran Desert. I, you can tell right away looking at that picture that that is Sonoran Desert. How do you know? Cactus. Yeah, by the saguaro cactus. Okay. Saguaro cacti are Awesome. That cactus right there is probably 250 years old. Okay. 
Um, so, so there's Choya. We had talked a little bit about Choya earlier, I think, in this semester. Um, I was talking about Choya in Baja, California, and the fact that the free-range cattle in Baja feed on Choya. Um, this, it's also called teddy bear cactus because in the picture it looks kind of like a teddy bear. But of course the spines have these reverse barbs on them so once it penetrates your skin, the only way to get it out is to push it all the way through. If you try and pull it out, you're just going to rip all your skin open, which is kind of interesting. It's an interesting defense mechanism on the part of the, of the cactus. And of course the cattle, when they eat that stuff, there's nothing else to eat. So their lips and cheeks and tongues are impaled on these things and they're all pussy and infected. And it, they, each little spine just has to work its way through before it finally gets, and of course by that time it's been replaced by a dozen others. So here's the saguaro cactus, you know, this ancient old thing. Um, that is the defining species for the Sonoran Desert. The only place you find it is in the Sonoran Desert. And what it does is it tells you something very important about the Sonoran Desert. So people in Southern California, um, in, in all those rich bitch communities in, you know, in Orange County and so on, they love they love the sense of being in Southern California. And they, they have these little tiny yards. They build 11.2 houses per acre. Okay? 11 point, one acre of land, 11.2 dwellings on that acre of land. So they put a premium on landscaping their little postage stamp sized yards. Okay? And oftentimes what people will do is they will drive out to Arizona and dig up a saguaro cactus. They'll come back and they'll plant it in their perfectly manicured little postage stamp sized front yard. It's against the law, but their neighbors aren't going to rat, rat them out. So they all plant these beautiful, so a saguaro cactus like that, right, 200, 300 years old, and they'll dig it up and they'll plant it. They'll pay some guy to go out there, dig it up, they'll do it right, now plant it, and it'll be there all summer long. It'll do great. And then in the fall, they're going to get a frost. Even in Southern California, you occasionally get frost. The frost comes, and the next morning, that thing is hanging over like a limp sock. Okay, it's dead. Saguaro cacti do not tolerate frost. So what that tells you right off the bat is, if you see saguaro cacti, it's not going to freeze. You're not even going to get a frost. So what does the person in California do? Comes out to his front yard and says, oh shit. And instead of going, well that was dumb, I guess these things don't tolerate frost. No. They cut it down, chop it up, and then they hire some guy to go back out to the snoring desert and get him another one. They'll go through 10, 11, 12 of those things before they finally give up. You can imagine the impact that that has on the desert community because there are millions of people that live in Southern California. Tens of thousands of them want these things and every year they go and get more to replace the ones that they kill. The cool thing about Saguaro, one of the cool things about Saguaro cactus, as you look at it and you look up at the top of the cactus, You'll see these holes, and the holes are made by cactus wrens. This little tiny wren that lives in the Sonoran Desert and nests, it builds its nest inside the saguaro cactus. And it'll perch on there, and it'll excavate this little hole, makes the hole bigger and bigger, and goes in there and lays its eggs and does its mating thing. All that stuff takes place right inside that little nest cavity. But those holes are only on the north side of the cactus, not on the south side. I wonder why. Does it have to do with the wind? With the what? Wind. No. I don't care about no stinking wind. See, this is this is the price you pay for living in a place like southeast Missouri, 
if you lived if you lived in the in the Mojave or in the Sonoran or the Chihuahuan, you would understand all about north and south. Is it rain? Rain? Nah. You hardly get any rain out there at all. Since it's in the northern hemisphere, the sun is primarily on the southern side most of the year. Yeah, because the sun is hitting the south side of that thing, right? The north side is predominantly in the shade. The north side is cooler. So they're only putting their nest cavities on the cool side of that saguaro cactus. Okay. So um, let's look at some other um, other uh, communities. Think about the Mojave Desert. We already talked about the fact that the defining species for the Mojave is creosote bush. Creosote bush is called creosote bush because of this oil that it produces. It produces the same oil that's used to coat telephone poles. And they don't do it anymore, but in the past, telephone poles were coated with the oil from the creosote bush. So they would go out and harvest the creosote to produce the oils that they could then use to coat telephone poles. Okay. Um, how about sagebrush scrub? If you've ever seen sagebrush, uh, there are two species in, in the northern hemisphere, Artemisia tridentata, and then uh, there's another one. So tridentata, the leaves have three, um, three little prongs on the end, or three little lobes on the end. Um, it's also sometimes referred to as purple sage. Uh, when it rains, the sage looks as though it's purple, and when, when it's wet, it has this glorious smell, right? And you've probably encountered that smell in some sort of boutique shops and whatnot, or even in cooking, right? Sometimes people put sage in their cooking. Um, so the sagebrush occurs throughout the Great Basin, gets into New Mexico, which is not part of the Great Basin, is in California, it is all over the western US. And sagebrush is this slow growing brush, right? And if you've ever been out there, right, I mean, the cattle that are running free range on Bureau of Land Management land, on BLM land, they'll eat it, but they don't particularly like it. They instead prefer to consume other sorts of grasses. Now, one of the things that happened in, this, in the Great Basin is that the ranchers at some point decided that open range land wasn't productive enough for the number of cattle that they wanted to run on that land. So what the ranchers did was they got some grass out of China, which is referred to as cheat grass, and they planted cheat grass. And cheat grass is awesome because it grows really, really, really fast, and it spreads really fast. So they thought they had found the solution to their problems, and they started planting cheat grass throughout the Great Basin, and it took over. And the thing about cheat grass is, though, that the cattle refuse to eat it. So now you go out into the, into the Great Basin and you see these huge areas where there's nothing but cheat grass and almost no sagebrush. And the cheat grass is perfect. The cattle won't touch it. So now we're faced with this problem. How do we eradicate the cheat grass? Of course, because what the cheap grass is doing is it's using up all the soil resources and out-competing the sagebrush. It is hard to go into the Great Basin and find areas of sagebrush that are not highly disturbed, that are sort of pristine kinds of sagebrush habitat. It's difficult to do that. Um, back to those creosote uh, bushes. Uh, one interesting thing about creosote bush uh, it has a series of allochemicals. The roots produce these chemicals that suppress growth of other plants. And that's why when you fly over the sagebrush scrub, you realize all the, or rather over the creosote scrub, all the creosotes are perfectly spaced. Because the root system is producing all of these chemicals that kill all the neighboring plants. So each plant, as it grows up, has this perfect circle around it where nothing else can grow. And then you have the next 
the next creosote, and the next, and in the spaces that are in between those circles, that's where you get these other species of plants growing. How's about in a sand dune habitat? Uh, these are the um, Algodones dunes in Southern California. Um, you look at those dunes and you say, oh, well, there's nothing there, right? Uh, except that there is, right? You see all of those little clumps right there? That's all vegetation on those dunes. The thing about that dune is that it's not stationary. It's moving. And in, in the Antiparago Desert, there are no roads. Right? In the dunes in Colorado, there are no roads. And the reason they don't build roads in those areas is because this is where the dune is this year. Next year, it's moved. So the dunes are moving. The wind is moving them every day. They're moving just a little bit. And if you build a road, the road is going to get covered up by the dune. So now you look at that and you say, well, that's this barren landscape. And it's not. Because if you come out onto that dune first thing in the morning, and you look at the dune, you'll see footprints everywhere. A lot of the footprints are by insects. A lot of the footprints are by lizards. You'll see tracks where the snakes have been. You'll see footprints by rodents and, and you know, by kangaroo rats and wood rats and mice and things of that sort. But this thing is teeming with life. In the summertime, the surface of that sand might be 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, it is scorching hot. But if you go down 12 inches below the surface, stick your hand down there, it's like 72 degrees. So all the heat is at the surface. You go down below it just a little bit, and it's nice and cool. There are these three dune systems in Southern California. Uh, three major dune systems. And on each dune system is a different species of fringe toed lizards. The fringe toed lizards are in the genus Uma. And they have, on their fourth toe of each foot, they have these really long fringes, okay, these little projections that stick out from the fourth toe. And what these guys do is they run across the surface of the sand using those fringes, kind of like oars. They can actually propel themselves across the surface with minimal contact on the surface. And they then will get to a place, and the surface of the animal looks exactly like the sand. And they'll bury themselves right under the surface of the sand, and you can't tell where they are. And on the top of the head of the lizard is this little opening and a little lens. It's called the pineal eye. Those of you that do yoga, when they start talking about, what do they call it, your third eye? That's the one they're talking about. It's the pineal eye. Of course, on you, it's covered up by all this bone. Right below that opening in the skull, that paper-thin bone that exists right above the pineal gland, Right, is this pineal gland. That pineal gland in you has dropped down and is on the underside of your brain rather than on the top of the brain. It becomes part of the epiphysis. It's related, it's associated with the hypothalamus and it controls your thermostat. It does that in you, it does that in the lizard as well. So the lizard is using light to set its thermostat and control its thermoregulation. So what the lizard does is it buries itself under the surface of the sand. Everything is covered except for the pineal gland. And it's using that to measure light quality. In the Negev Desert, which is right there facing the Mediterranean, the, the wind comes in off the Mediterranean and in the evening, it comes over the dunes. And if you look at the dune in the morning, you'll realize there are all these ridges, ridges across the top of the dune. And what's happened is that at night, these beetles come out and make these little ridges in the sand. And the ridges are perpendicular to the direction of the wind. So what happens as the wind blows, it hits the top of that little ridge on the top of the dune, 
there's this little shadow right behind it, okay, this wind shadow. And at that point, you get all this condensation because the air coming off the Mediterranean is moist, the desert is dry, and you get all these little droplets of moisture accumulating on the backside of that little ridge that this beetle made. And then the beetle spends its morning walking up and down this little ridge that it's made, drinking these little drops of moisture that it harvested from the wind. It's awesome. So you look at that and you realize there's actually a hell of a lot going on on that dune. Um, these are the Kelso dunes, um, and there you can see that vegetation, and of course the vegetation ultimately gets covered up. You can tell that the dune is shifting, it's moving. And more just to give you a sense of scale, there's a truck down there, and somebody's been walking here. I mean, it's, these are landscapes which just seem to go on forever. Desert landscapes are glorious. All right. When we think about those sorts of communities, right, we've been talking about desert communities and so on, uh, there are ponderosa pine communities out west and pinyon juniper woodland communities. For those of you that are interested in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has this huge program on attempting to control pinyon juniper woodlands. And what's happening in pinyon juniper woodlands is that they are expanding. And they're expanding down into the sagebrush scrub and expanding into Joshua Tree woodlands and the sorts of habitats that are favored by cattle. So there's this sort of interagency cooperative effort between the Bureau of Land Management, the USDA, right, Fish and Wildlife, all these different agencies trying to control the changes that are taking place naturally in these habitats. Why is the pinyon juniper woodland expanding? For all sorts of reasons. A lot of it is related to the activities of humans. At any rate, back in the 19 or in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, there was a fellow um, by the name of C. Hart Merriam. Uh, he's the guy for which um, Dipodomys merriami is named. As a matter of fact, there are lots of species of animals that have the specific name merriami. So they are all named in honor of C. Hart Merriam. C. Hart Merriam was at Berkeley. Uh, he was associated with the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley. Um, and uh, he was an early naturalist in California, uh, out in the West, and he did a lot of descriptive work. And what he noticed was kind of interesting. Um, so he noticed that, for example, here there's this, this this pinyon juniper woodland. And you're in this very specific kind of place and all these pinyon trees. Pinyon trees are pine trees. And a pinyon tree might get to be 20 feet tall tops. Most of them are maybe 15 feet tall, something like that. So it's not a gigantic pine tree. There are two species of pinyons in, in, um, out here or in the US. Uh, one species in Colorado. Um, you know, if, you, if those of you that have been to Mesa Verde in Colorado, you will have seen that species. And then in California, this and in New Mag or California, uh, the species that you see is Monophila, so uh, Pinus Monophila, the one one needle um, pinion pine. The cool thing about pinions is that they produce these pinion nuts. And I think we've already talked about um, hantavirus, didn't we not? Yeah, where the the mice peed on the... Yeah, the mice pee on their little pinion nuts, right? And then the Californians that are now living in Santa Fe want to do the full New Mexico experience and steal the pinion nuts from the... Yeah, those... Yeah. Consequences. Life is full of consequences. All right, so at any rate, here you have these... these and he notices that there are these, these areas where all you have is pinion and juniper. And as you go a little bit down the slope, it changes from pinion and juniper, right, to Joshua trees. 
So there's not this straight line between the two. As you're coming out of the pinion in the juniper, you have uh, Mormon tea, ephedra, and those sorts of things. And you're coming down, and suddenly you start to see all these Joshua trees that are popping up. And the number of pinion trees is getting less and less. So now you're in Joshua tree rather than it. And if you keep going downhill, suddenly you come out of the Joshua trees, and now you're in the sagebrush. And you keep going downhill a little bit farther, and now you're in the creosote. You are now in the Mojave. So we noticed that there was this elevational relationship amongst all of these different community types. So you're starting off at low elevations or at, in one kind of elevation, not necessarily low, but at a lower elevation, and you're in creosote scrub, you're in Mojave Desert. And you go up, and now you're in some sagebrush. And you go up a little bit farther, and now suddenly you're in Joshua trees. And you go up a little bit farther, and now suddenly you are in pinyon juniper. You go up a little bit higher, and you leave the pinyon juniper behind, and you are now in the ponderosa pine, Jeffrey pine habitat. You go a little bit higher still, and now you're in the spruce and hemlock habitat. You go a little bit higher still, and now you're in the alpine fell field. So all the trees are gone. Now you've got a rocks, and you've got some scraggly looking scrubs, and you've got a lot of lichens and things of that sort. Has anyone here ever been above tree line? It's an awesome experience. The first thing you realize is breathing is a little bit different when you're up at that elevation, okay? Because there's not a lot of oxygen up there. Why is it that beyond a Above some certain elevation, there are no longer any trees. Is it air pressure? Air pressure? Or you mean the partial pressure of oxygen? Yeah. Or, or more importantly, the par partial pressure of CO2, right? The plant doesn't need any oxygen. Well, that's one of the components, right? There simply isn't enough CO2 at that elevation to enable photosynthesis. What else is missing? What else is different? At that elevation, what's going to happen? It's much colder. It's going to, it gets a heck of a lot colder, right? What else? Well, it, yeah, there will be there will be moisture. The snowpack could be significant. This is the price you pay for living in the Midwest, where it's humid all the time. What's what's the relative humidity going to be above the tree line? Close to zero. Okay, which means there's no moisture in the atmosphere. Which means. As soon as the stomata on those leaves open up, all the moisture is gone. So it's like a desert. What's the definition of a desert? No. Mojave can get butt biting cold. Even in the summer. At night, the Mojave can be a very cold place. That's why working in the Mojave any time of year is hard because you have to carry gear for extreme heat and extreme cold. So just right. Okay. Except for when. The average rainfall is like below a certain amount. Yes. Mean annual mean mean annual evapotranspiration exceeds mean annual precipitation. So the amount of moisture lost from the plant is greater than the amount of moisture that falls. That's how we define a desert. And as you go above the tree line, suddenly that's exactly where you are. The amount of evapotranspiration is exceedingly high. The point is, Sea Heart Merriam recognizes all of these different habitat associations. Think about the ponderosa pine. Ponderosa pine, how do you how do you know a tree is a ponderosa pine? We don't have ponderosa pine here in Missouri. But if you were out west, how would you know it was a ponderosa pine? 
way you tell is you get real close to the tree and you stick your nose right into the cracks in the bark and you take a good long whiff and what you'll smell is vanilla. If you can smell vanilla, even if you can't see the needles or you can't see the cones, you say, yep, that's ponderosa pine. It's the only tree on this side of the Sierras that smells like vanilla. You go over the top of the Sierras and you smell a tree and it smells like vanilla, it's Jeffrey pine, not ponderosa. So there's something weird we don't understand about Jeffrey pine and ponderosa pine but there's that smell of vanilla on this side of the Sierras, not on the other side, okay? So let's imagine you're in Southern California and you desperately want to go see ponderosa pine, get that whiff of vanilla. Where would you go? You're on, you're on, you're in Manhattan Beach, you're in Malibu Beach, Laguna Beach, you're in Laguna Beach, and you want to go see the ponderosa pine. So there you are, you're standing on the Pacific Coast Highway. What do you do? Where do you go? Well, where are the ponderous pines? Are they on the beach? No. On the beach is going to be what habitat? Coastal sage scrub. Okay? What comes after coastal sage scrub? As you go up a little bit, what vegetation are you going to get into? The chaparral. Okay? Now, you go up a little bit higher in elevation. If you go, if you go up to Big Bear Lake or Lake Arrowhead, that's where you will find the ponderosa pine. So one way to get there is by going up in elevation. Or you can just go north. In other words, if you want to get to the pine trees, you have to go up or north. Why? What happens as you go up in elevation? Colder. It gets cooler and there's more moisture. You get past the tree line and there's less moisture. But as you go up, there's more moisture. As you go north, what's happening? Colder. It gets cooler, right? The closer you are to the equator, the warmer it gets. You go north along the Pacific Coast Highway, it gets cooler and cooler and cooler. In Anchorage, Alaska, it's a whole hell of a lot cooler than it is in San Diego. So going north means more moderate temperatures, cooler temperatures, and more moisture. Going up, more moderate temperatures, more moisture. So you want to find ponderosa pine? North or up? How's about sagebrush scrub? Well, if you're on the beach, again, you have to go north or up. So these life zones are sequential. So alpine fell field, spruce, pine, right? Pinion, pinion juniper woodland, Joshua tree woodland, sagebrush scrub, creosote scrub, full-blown Mojave Desert, okay? It's in that sequence. Those are Merriam's life zones. Just one other habitat I want to talk about very quickly, and that is, um, um, not mesquite. Uh, mesquite is a kind, of a kind of bush tree. It's a tree, right, but it has a bush shape. Um, that you find throughout uh, the Chihuahua Desert. It's in New Mexico and, and parts of Arizona and so on. Uh, and that's the stuff people love to use for barbecue because it has this very characteristic sort of um, flavor to it. Um, but the chaparral habitat is the sort of interesting habitat. And as a biologist, you should know about the chaparral. Um, for, those, for those of you that have ever watched um, that old television program, MASH, You've seen episodes, and it's supposed to take place in Korea. It, it was filmed in the chaparral habitat of Southern California, okay? And every time you look at it, you go, God, that's glorious chaparral, and it's supposed to be Korea. At any rate, the chaparral habitat is this sort of phenomenal kind of habitat. It's filled with these plants, 
these plants that at the age of 15 become senescent, meaning they no longer reproduce. So up until the age of 15, they're reproducing, but once they reach 15 years of age, they start to become brittle and they dry out. And reproduction slows down so that by the time they're 30 years old, there's zero reproduction taking place by these plants. What's happened in California is that people are building their houses up in the chaparral. So the chaparral plant, it burns naturally every 15 years. A lightning strike, the chaparral burns. The seeds of the chaparral require scorching in order to germinate. The seeds aren't going to germinate unless they've been scorched by flames. Now, a 15-year-old chaparral, it burns. The next spring, you have all these new chaparral plants popping up. But what's happened, because people are building their houses up in chaparral, the state of California has invoked Smokey the Bear. And what they're doing is they're suppressing fires in order to save all these houses. The same thing happened in Paradise, California, where the whole town burned down. And everybody's boo-hooing. And it's sad. It really is. But for fuck's sake, what are you doing building your house in this habitat where it burns naturally and relying on Smokey the Bear to put the fire out, making the situation worse for the next fire season? If you want to start stop this plague of fires out in California, let them burn. Okay? Because if you let them burn, they burn naturally all by themselves. If you allow the fire cycle to go naturally, everything will be fine, and you just have to be smart and don't build your house in a place where it burns regularly. So here's the chaparral. You can go out into the chaparral now and find spots of chaparral that have not burned in 80 years. That means for 60 plus years, that plant has been sitting there drying out, desiccating, waiting for a spark so that it can burn. Now when the chaparral burns, it burns so hot that the seeds, instead of being scorched, are totally incinerated. So what does the state of California do? You now have these hillsides that are totally denuded of vegetation. They're black. What do they do? Build more houses on the black land. Build more houses and or they'll plant grass. Do they plant native grasses? No, they'll plant stuff like cheatgrass because it grows fast. And it looks green in the spring, and everybody's happy, thinking that their government did something positive for them. And it didn't. So, why do I care? I care because of the California condor, which is this bird that has this enormous wingspan. There are two condors. There's the California condor, and then there's the Andean condor. The California condor was this bird which feeds in the chaparral. So it lands and it walks into the chaparral and it'll feed on dead things. It feeds on dead jackrabbits and dead coyotes and dead foxes and dead rats and whatever it can find. But it'll fly, it'll spot something dead, it lands. But because we've suppressed the fire, the chaparral has gotten very thick. And it's so thick now that the, that the condor can't find any place to land. It can't even see anything because everything is covered up. So what the condors do, or what they were doing, is they would land in parking lots and walk into the chaparral looking for something to eat. And they obviously can't find it. Or if they do find something, they then can't find their way out. So we were down to a population of six condors. That's all that were left. And they brought these six condors into captivity and they attempted to start a breeding program. As you know, with only six birds, the amount of genetic variation is going to be almost nil. So the upshot of it was that they managed to get to a point, I think there are now 40 birds or something like that. They've been doing some genetic tricks, trying to improve genetic variability and so on. They're trying to release the birds back into nature. There is some success, right? But they're doomed to extinction as long as we allow people to suppress fire in Southern California. This is a species which is dependent ultimately on fire burning the chaparral.
So when all those rich bitches build their houses in the chaparral and are boo-hooing when their house burns to the ground, all I can say is, tough shit, man. Shouldn't have built there. You know, you have no business building in a habitat where it burns naturally. But they do. All right. Like a fireproof house. Like the outside of the house or the wall or something. Well, in California, there are very, most houses in California have stucco walls, right? So that the flames, the flames don't get to the wood or the siding. So they don't build side, and the, the windows are all aluminum or, you know, something like that. And the garage doors are all going to be metal or plastic or something of that sort. But then their roofs tend to be cedar shakes, which last a long time. But of course, cedar shakes go just like that. There are all sorts of fire suppression items built into the building codes in Southern California. All right. All right, so let's think um, about communities as co-evolved units. Um, let's imagine we have some environmental gradient on the x-axis, okay? And I want you to compare these two diagrams. Remember, when we're talking about communities as co-evolved units, what we mean is that most of the species in this community share a long coevolutionary history. That would be represented by this diagram on the top. Here's this environmental gradient. And each of these represents the resource utilization function, the niche for a different species of plant or animal. So you notice here, all these species occur together. And then here, you have all of those species, and they occur together. And then the same thing here, and then the same thing there. So there's a system, this upper graph is a system where the species, you can imagine, share a long co-evolutionary history. The bottom one, the same environmental gradient, but now look at what happens to the species. They're no longer organized into these discrete communities. So here you are and say, yeah, well, that's kind of a desert. Yeah, that's kind of a woodland. And yeah, that's kind of a you know, ponderosa pine woodland. And, and yeah, that's kind of a, a spruce habitat right there. But you notice that the species go across multiple different kinds of communities. So on this one, they are not co-evolved. Here, they are. Why is that important? It's important because when we're looking at these species and trying to understand their history of competition, their co-evolution, here it's going to make sense. Here, it will not. So the question is, what do we find in nature? Which one is it? Is it like this, or is it like this? Throughout most of the 60s, probably into the 1980s, everyone would have wanted to believe that this was the way it was. Okay? Most of the papers that you read in the scientific literature would talk about communities as co-evolved units, implying that this was the way communities were structured. And in fact, it turns out that for the most part, it's like this graph down below. So with rare exceptions, most communities are not co-evolved units. What are the exceptions? The exceptions are things like tide pools. So the rocky intertidal zone has co-evolved communities. Has anybody here ever been to a rocky intertidal habitat? OK, the rocky intertidal zone, um, when you're standing on a rocky beach, you're going down the slope, and the tide is out, you look down and you see all these little pools of water. And in those pools, 
you look into the pool, you'll see all kinds of stuff. You'll see crabs and sea anemones and barnacles and nudibranchs and starfish and mussels and all kinds of different invertebrates and algae and things of that sort. And what happens to this tide pool, when the tide comes in, all the nutrients get replaced and new animals come and go and so on. But within that tide pool, the organisms that are in there have very specific tolerances to what's going on. Okay? Think about that. Imagine you're close, you're low on the slope versus you're high on the slope. When you're high on the slope, how is the environment different? So you're above the average high tide line, that means your tide, your pool only gets refreshed maybe every second or third day. Now when it's not being refreshed, what happens inside that pool? The temperature starts to go up. The salinity goes up. Dissolved oxygen goes down. Compared to when you're low on the slope, the water is being refreshed every couple of hours. Okay, temperature is lower. Dissolved oxygen is higher. All those, they are fundamentally different habitats. All right? So what species do you find in the upper tide pools versus the lower tide pools? They are fundamentally different. A lot of the species that you find in the lower tide pool, you're not going to find in the upper tide pool. Because the tolerance, you've exceeded the tolerance limits for a lot of species. In addition to that, what you do find in the upper pool is tiny compared to what you find in the lower tide pool. But amongst the organisms that are in those tide pools, they have a long shared evolutionary history. The only place you find them is in those tide pools. Okay? So that's one example of a co-evolved community. So if you wanted to understand competition between organisms, that is one place you would look. So we can go through lots of different examples. Uh, we can look at oak trees. Um, and you'll see that some oaks are down here on elevation and other oaks are up there, right? So there are these sorts of clues that you know, there might be these co-evolved groups of oaks. Um, we could look at, um, again, you could look at beaches and white oaks and, and red oaks and so on. You can begin to see some of that separation, but the amount of, the amount of evidence that you have for communities as co-evolved units is actually pretty thin. So most species that we see, their distributions are defined not by, not by the communities that they're in, but those, the distributions of those species are defined by their tolerance limits to some kind of environmental gradient. The first and most important thing is tolerance limit. The second thing is going to be interactions with other species. Skip through all of that. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. So, just as an example, um, this is a, a lizard, um, uh, Holbrookia. Um, uh, the genus is Holbrookia, and it's kind of an interesting lizard. Uh, the bottom of the tail has black and white stripes. And this is a lizard that you only find um, in desert washes. So the cool thing about this lizard is when a bird comes around and a bird starts pursuing it, the little lizard runs away. And as it runs, it takes that tail and it flashes, it takes the tail and flashes it back and forth like that, sort of waving it, saying, here I am, here I am. Because it has these black and white stripes on it, it's very easy and very obvious. So the bird sees it and follows that tail. So he's scurrying along this stream bed, 
right? And it's a dry wash, right? There's no water there. It's just scurrying along from rock to rock and bush to bush. And the bird is chasing it, and that tail keeps flashing back and forth. And lizards have tail autonomy. So at some point, the lizard will drop the tail and run away and get away. And the tail continues to wiggle back and forth, flashing the black and white stripes. So in the worst case scenario, the bird comes along, grabs the tail, munches on the tail, but the lizard got away. So here's the species which is a which had that unique kind of behavior. There's another lizard species, Calosaurus draconoides, the zebra tail lizard, which lives in a totally different place and does exactly the same thing. It's a totally different genus. It's not closely related at all and has co-evolved exactly the same sort of behavior and color pattern. It also lives only in washes, desert washes. So if you're someone who says the world or the communities are structured by interspecific competition, then that's a perfect example. See, here are two species that are doing exactly the same thing. If they were in the same place, they would com be competing, but natural selection has forced them to be separate. One species is here, the other species is there. There's no overlap, hence the proof of interspecific competition. Or it might be simply chance convergence. That's where the basic argument has, broken, has come to. Okay. If we look at other sorts of systems, um, I think I'm going to skip all that. Let's look at some um, other sorts of, of systems and talk about communities as co-evolved units. And uh, the, you can hardly see that picture at all. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, when you think about them, the interactions that are taking place amongst these communities are, um, are intricate. So for example, in a scenario like this, uh, um, if you're up in the Tetons, one of the interesting things that's happened in the Tetons is this relationship between the bison, the wolves, um, and the elk, and the, and the grizzly bears. So as a consequence of suppressing wolves, the bison and the elk have changed their foraging patterns. They've come into some of these meadows, and the way they've foraged has totally changed the landscape. So all of those community boundaries that once existed have now been degraded. But within recent years, with the reintroduction of wolves and with the expansion of the wolf populations, the wolves have come back into the system, and suddenly, just with the presence of wolves, the vegetation in some of these lower valleys has changed dramatically. And what's happened is the presence of the wolves has changed the foraging behavior of the elk and of the bison. In other words, the elk and the bison are no longer willing to forage in a place where they are susceptible to predation. And the consequence of that is, is that they're changing the locations where they forage, and that then reduces the foraging pressure on those meadows, and the vegetation is changed. And what that means is that suddenly the elk and the bison are gone, and suddenly the moose are coming back into that particular system. So those sorts of dynamics are intricate. Those dynamics are a function of little changes here and little changes there. All right. I'm going to stop there for today. Um, the lecture next week, um, we're going to go into a little bit more detail on community structure. Uh, a little bit of mathematical stuff. Um, and then we have what after that? How many more weeks do we have? I think this is our last full week. Last full week, yeah. But then uh, we have Monday of next week. And 
How many weeks do we get after the Thanksgiving? We get one real week and then one finals week. Yeah, so one more, one more. We have a lecture on Monday and one more lecture, and then we have the exam, I think. All right. Have a good week, guys. I turned the poster.